Topic 1. Tectonic Processes and Hazards. Inquiry Question 2. Why do some tectonic hazards develop into disasters? Welcome to this Tectonic Processes and Hazards Summary video. This video will guide you through Inquiry Question 2. Make sure to look out for case studies as the video progresses and remember that these examples are covered in more depth in my case study videos. The timestamps for each part of the video can be found below if you wish to revise a specific aspect of this inquiry question. Let's begin. Part 1. Natural Hazards and Disasters To start this video, it is important to understand the definitions of these key terms. These are used throughout the inquiry question and you must know their meanings. A hazard is a perceived natural event that has the potential to threaten both life and property. A disaster is the realization of a hazard that causes a significant impact on a vulnerable population. Vulnerability is the ability to anticipate, cope with, resist, and recover from a disaster. And finally, resilience is the ability to protect lives, livelihoods, and infrastructure from destruction, and to restore areas after a natural disaster has occurred. As we will see next, it is important to understand that a disaster only occurs when a vulnerable population is exposed to a natural hazard. The model here is called Degg's model. It is a useful way to visualize the theory that a disaster only occurs when a vulnerable population is exposed to a hazard. You may notice how it looks similar to a Venn diagram, and you should remember this model, as you may be asked about it, or asked to give an example of a disaster model. Continuing with this theory of disasters, we can now see the hazard risk equation. It means that the geophysical event that poses a threat is multiplied by the social group that is at risk. This means that the hazard is made worse by vulnerability. However, this equation illustrates how the capacity to cope can reduce the risk posed by the hazard. Capacity is the country's ability to withstand and manage the hazard event. This equation can be used to differ between two disasters and understand why they may have been different. For example, the Nepal earthquake of 2015 had a similar magnitude to the New Zealand earthquake of 2016. But 9,000 people died in the Nepal earthquake, compared to just two in New Zealand. We can recognize how, as a high-income country, New Zealand reduced the risk through its capacity to cope. To conclude this part of the video, we will look at the pressure and release model. It is another way to illustrate the link between vulnerability and disasters. You will notice how it is much more detailed than Degg's model from earlier. But it used the same theory. As you can see, vulnerability is shown as being dynamic and progressive. Within the pressure model, there are three sections of vulnerability. These are Root causes, the existing core issues Dynamic pressures, influenced by root causes, and change because of this Unsafe conditions are factors that can make a disaster significantly worse. These factors are created as a result of the previous two categories. They cannot improve without deeper societal change. In this part of the video, we will be looking at tectonic hazards, how they are measured, and how they are profiled. Firstly, we will look at the scales used for tectonic hazards. This is the Richter scale. It is used to measure the severity of earthquakes on a scale from 0 to 9. It is a measurement of the amplitude of the waves produced by an earthquake. It is an absolute scale. This means it will be the same wherever the earthquake happens. This is the moment magnitude scale. It is a modern measurement used by seismologists. It describes earthquakes in terms of the energy released, as you can see on the diagram. It measures the magnitude of an earthquake based on its seismic moment. The final scale for earthquakes is the Mercalli scale. This measures the experienced impacts of an earthquake. It's based on the observable damage caused by the earthquake, which can be subjective. The Volcanic Explosivity Index is a scale used to measure the size of explosive volcanic eruptions. Volume of products, eruption cloud height, and qualitative observations are used to determine the explosivity value. On this diagram you can see the Mount Pinatubo eruption of 1991. This is an essential case study to know, so make sure to watch my 5-minute summary on the event. Here you can see examples of hazard event profiles. Hazard event profiles compare all of the physical processes shared by hazard events. 
they help governments decide which areas most money should be spent on to improve resilience. They are useful for comparing two earthquakes to each other, if similar metrics are used. However, when comparing earthquakes to tsunamis or volcanic eruptions, they may not be as simple to read. This section will look at links between development and vulnerability. Firstly, the development disaster relationship, as shown on the diagram. You should understand this relationship and be able to explain the factors involved, both economically and socially. Disasters can create development opportunities. In the wake of disasters, decision makers can be more willing to make changes, knowing that it is necessary to protect the population. This development will include disaster risk measures and reduce vulnerability for the future. Disasters can also destroy development. Physical assets are destroyed, causing a loss of production capacity, market access and input materials. Damage is dealt to infrastructure and livelihoods. The features of disasters that cause this can be revised using my inquiry question 1 summary. Importantly, the workforce can be weakened. This damages and limits development and can become a longer-term issue if labor shortages cannot be reduced. Development reduces disaster risk. Resilience is increased by improving living conditions. These include drinking water access and high-quality infrastructure. Poverty can be reduced using fair trade and technology, reducing vulnerability. Development can cause disaster risk. Unsustainable development can create unsafe working conditions and degrade the environment. Development can generate inequality and result in vulnerable members of society. This is the risk-poverty nexus. The risk-poverty nexus model shows the strong link between poverty and the impacts of a hazard. Those in poverty are the most impacted by disasters and remain in poverty because of the disaster. Their ability to recover and reconstruct after a major disaster is often limited, further diminishing their ability to increase resilience to disasters. Similar to the pressure and release model, there are underlying issues which fuel this issue. Examples of these issues are weak political organization, political corruption, and uneven economic development. The characteristics of a natural disaster are influenced by human and physical factors. Development plays a major role in this. Low-income countries can see huge impacts if a disaster occurs as a result of their infrastructure being weak and unable to cope. Let's look at some factors that influence this. Developed countries suffer higher but short-term economic losses, whereas the social and economic impacts are far more long-term in developing countries. Poorer people in developing countries are often marginalized socially, politically and geographically, meaning they may not receive early warnings on the hazard, increasing their vulnerability. More developed countries also tend to have early warning systems, whereas developing countries may struggle to afford this technology. Financial resources, effective governments and strong community links are all required for early warning systems well-organized evacuation procedures, seismic-proof buildings and protective barriers. On a local level, inequalities have the following impacts on hazard impacts. Poorer countries have disproportionately higher mortality and economic loss risks. Countries also have a particularly low resilience to these losses. Disaster losses can lead to major setbacks in their economic developments. At a local level poorer areas still suffer disproportionately high levels of damage in disasters, this is related to factors such as unsafe housing. People living in these poor areas have little resilience and are very vulnerable. Expansion of informal settlements in hazard-prone areas also increase the risks. Lack of structure discourages planners from investing in the area, this leads to an even larger wealth gap. To look at how governance impacts natural disaster impacts, let's take a look at the Haiti earthquake of 2010. Haiti's poor governance significantly worsened the impact of the 2010 earthquake by failing to prepare adequately for natural disasters and lacking effective response systems. The Haitian government was plagued by political instability, widespread corruption, and weak institutions, leading to inadequate building codes and poor infrastructure that made buildings highly vulnerable to collapse. Emergency response systems were underfunded and uncoordinated, leaving the country with limited medical resources, poor transportation networks, and insufficient rescue operations. This lack of preparedness and slow response worsened casualties and hindered recovery efforts, amplifying the devastation of the earthquake. 